So without further ado, I would like to get our program started by introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Terrence Campbell. I'd like to say a few things about Dr. Campbell. Dr. Campbell is a member of the Scientific and Professional Advisory Board of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation of Philadelphia and serves on the Scientific Advisory Board of the National Association for Consumer Protection in Mental Health Practices. He has been designated a Fellow of the American Psychological Society in recognition of a distinguished contribution to psychological science. Dr. Campbell is also board certified in forensic psychology by the American Board of Professional Psychology. His publications have appeared in various scientific and professional journals. He is the author of five books, Beware the Talking Cure, Psychotherapy May Be Hazardous to Your Mental Health, <laughs> Smoke and Mirrors, The Devastating Effects of False Sexual Abuse Claims, Cross-Examining Experts in the Behavioral Sciences, co-authored with Dr. Lorandos. So please give a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, a man I greatly admire, Dr. Terrence Campbell. Thank you, very much. Thank you Joe. Thank you for the kind words of, of introduction. In opening, I'd like you to consider the following hypothetical scene. It's mid-November in the U.S. A father in Chicago is calling his adult son who resides in Arizona. And the father becomes very intense and very passionate as he says to his son, now I'm sorry to spring this on you, but I just can't live with your mother anymore. It has been it has been year after year after year of nag, heartbreak, frustration. I'm getting a divorce. The son is overwhelmed with surprise and says to his father, no, 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 no. Now don't do anything. I'll be home in a week or less. Don't do anything until I get home. And Father relents and, okay, he says, all right. Then Dad proceeds to call their adult daughter, who lives in Florida. And Dad explains to daughter, I've had it. There's no hope for the future of my marriage to your mother. I'm getting a divorce. Daughter reacts the same way as her brother did, saying, no, now don't do anything impulsive. Stop, think the issue through, and I'll be home, I'll be home, I'll be back in Chicago with you and mom in less than a week. And father again relents, hangs up the phone, turns to his wife with a mischievous smile, exchanges a high five with her, and says, it worked. They're both coming home for Thanksgiving and paying their own way. <laughs> what, have we, you know, what have we demonstrated here? Divorce can have a powerful, mobilizing impact on people. It motivates people to do something. And in, and in addition to mobilizing people, divorce can also polarize people. Where different people in families feel obligated to take sides and to engage in what some people have described as tribal warfare. A close friend of mine, a fellow psychologist, tells a story on himself when he learned about 
the separation and pending divorce of his son. And he said to his son, I don't need to know any details. You are my kid. I love you. You're right and she's wrong. And we don't need to go any further than that. Now, why doesn't parental alienation occur more frequently? The title of my talk. Well, there's at least two answers. The first answer is, fortunately, in the vast majority of circumstances of divorce with children, divorcing and divorced spouses are able to make a discrimination. They make a discrimination in terms of he or she may have been a major pain in the rear to be married to, but he or she is the only father or mother the kids are going to know. And things will go better for the kids if they have a good relationship with this person. So I want the kids to have a good relationship with their dad or with their mom. And I will cope with my ex-spouse as best as I can. And under those circumstances, uh, the majority of children of divorce continue to enjoy uh, good to fairly good relationships with both of their parents. But there are those circumstances that deteriorate into alienation with a backdrop of tribal warfare. In those circumstances, uh, the strategy is uh, take no prisoners and uh, it is a full out assault all the time at any cost. So then we can also ask again, now why is it that parental alienation does not occur more frequently? I would say because there are substantial portions of North America with relatively few numbers of mental health professionals. Because unfortunately, mental health professionals are guilty of polarizing divorcing families far, far too often. For example, consider the following case. A psychologist is providing therapy to a child. The therapy is trauma-focused therapy. It is alleged by the child's mother that the child, three years of age, has been sexually abused by the father. Reportedly, the basis of this allegation is that when the mother went to change the child's diaper, the child protested saying, no, no, no. There has been no finding of abuse by the local child protection agency, but a psychologist has nonetheless undertaken treatment with this child doing EMDR therapy, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy for this child because of the trauma she supposedly endured. Now, parenthetically, we should point out there are virtually no peer-reviewed data demonstrating that EMDR works. It is an unsubstantiated fad. Nonetheless, the therapist is instructing the child to visualize her father's penis in her mouth. And then the therapist is asking the child questions such as, can you think about your father putting his penis in your mouth? Where do you feel it on your body? 
Can you feel it in your mouth too? And the child would say, no, no. And the, and the therapist's response to the child's protest is to say, well, think about it. Think about it. When we consider human memory in general, children's memory in particular, a very, very important issue is what we call source monitoring processes or <coughs> excuse me, source monitoring errors. Source monitoring accounts for the false memories of people in general and children in particular. When people experience source monitoring errors that result in false memory, the people are getting imagination and reality confused with each other. Well, when we think about source monitoring, and we understand this therapist is saying to this child, uh, can you think about your father putting his penis in your mouth? What kind of source monitoring errors is she leading that child into? The more the child imagines these scenes, the more, the more familiar the scenes will become. And the more familiar the scenes become, the child can become convinced that she's remembering these scenes because they're becoming increasingly familiar. And then consequently, we can have a situation where the mother insists to, to child protection uh, personnel, now she's starting to recover the memories. And we can just imagine What's going to happen to dad in this scenario? Now, in this particular case, a court-appointed guardian ad litem has supervised all of dad's visitation with his little girl. The guardian ad litem described the little girl as relaxed and loving with her father and expressing a definite preference to visit with her father and spend time with him. In response to the guardian's information, the child's treating psychologist explained that in making those comments reported by the guardian, the child was really accommodating her father, that the child was responding to her father's expectation that she knew she was supposed to look forward to visitation with father. Now, stop and think for a moment and consider this logic on the part of the therapist. This is heads I win, tails you lose kind of logic. <coughs> More formally, consider the following claim. Everybody who consumes potion number nine reports its benefits. And those who report no benefits for potion number nine have not yet consumed it in sufficient quantities. Oh. Well, other than the fact I use that example because I'm from Motown, Detroit. Uh, if we stop and think, there's no outcome that can demonstrate potion number nine is of no benefit. All outcomes are consistent with, with, with the potions <laughs> supposed benefits and there are no outcomes disproving the potion supposed benefits. We see the same kind of logic and rationale going on with this therapist. That is, any and all symptoms that the child exhibit are consistent with her father having sexually abused her 
And given the therapist thinking, there are no symptoms or no behaviors that can rule out sexual abuse. This therapist also describes herself as a play therapist. In my opinion, there's a special place in hell reserved for play therapists. And, and, and wherever that special place is, there's many, many sandboxes and sand trays set aside because play therapists can't be happy without their sandboxes and sand trays. Um, the father has finally made a formal complaint to the Board of Psychology in the state in which he lives and the Board of Psychology is undertaking a review of that complaint. What will happen, I don't know. Many, many years ago, in the mid-1990s, I gave a speech to a National False Memory Syndrome Foundation convention. This was the group that was dealing with adults going into therapy and recovering memories of all kinds of parental abuse that they had supposedly repressed as children. And in my speech in the mid-90s in Baltimore, I pointed out that when it came to this ill-informed nonsense and, and, and contending with that ill-informed nonsense, the burden was that of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, that if we expected that the American Psychological Association or the American Psychiatric Association or the National Association of Social Workers or the American Counseling Association or the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapy or any other professional organization was going to honestly acknowledge and respond to the problems of repressed memory therapy, we were sadly mistaken. It wasn't going to happen. Too many of their members were doing it. Correspondingly, it is the responsibility of groups such as this one to carry the burden related to parental alienation, because if we think that professional organizations are going to do it, we're naive. We're sadly mistaken. There are too many mental health professionals who are contributing too frequently to problems of alienation, and the professional organizations representing mental health professionals are scared to death of this issue, and their response as a result is simply to back away. Now, let's think about this example of the child's therapist who is making these recommendations saying, no, this child should not have contact with her father. Well, the single most important consideration is this therapist is making recommendations about a relationship that she has never observed on a firsthand basis. May she be a counselor, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a marriage and family therapist, or any other mental health professional, her conduct is absolutely unethical. You don't make recommendations or draw inferences about people or relationships that you as a mental health professional have never seen. In Nonetheless, making these kinds of ill-informed recommendations, there are legions of mental health professionals who will do so relying on, quote, my clinical judgment supported by my many years of clinical experience. 
if you hear this phrase, my clinical judgment supported by my many years of clinical experience, run. Run from anybody who makes that statement. This is a person who knows next to nothing about the relevant empirical research and also does not want to know much about the relevant empirical data. They would merely uh, prefer to cling to, I know what I know and what I know is sufficient. The relationship between accumulated clinical experience and judgmental accuracy ranges between minuscule to absolutely none. In child custody matters, any well-informed mental health professional must begin with the premise that joint custody serves the welfare of children more effectively than sole custody. That is the basic beginning assumption that is premised upon what well-informed mental health professionals call <clears throat> base rate considerations. Psychiatrists in their residencies are often told, if you hear hoofbeats in North America, think horses before you think zebras because there's more horses in North America than there are zebras. When it comes to divorce, children of divorce, all other things being equal, fare much better in circumstances of joint custody compared to sole custody. So if we're going to recommend against joint custody, you better have compelling, reliable evidence for making such recommendations. This consideration of the preferability of joint physical and legal custody leads us next to issues of child custody evaluations. And there are numerous professionals creating or sowing the seeds for alienation in the child custody evaluations that they do. Let's look at child custody evaluations kind of in, in a stepwise manner, okay? So the first issue in a child custody evaluation is an informed consent procedure the professional doing the evaluation is obligated to clearly identify himself or herself in terms of what's your training, what is your licensure, what is your authority for doing this evaluation, what questions will this evaluation address, who will get copies of any report that you write corresponding to this evaluation? Now, these issues may sound rather dry and pro forma, but not necessarily. For example, let's assume Dr. Smith has undertaken a child custody evaluation and Dr. Smith's going to do psychological testing. Moreover, understand Dr. Smith is a psychiatrist. No, Dr. Smith, as a psychiatrist, has no business doing psychological testing. I don't do blood studies, and I know I'm not qualified to do them. Dr. Smith and any other psychiatrist should understand that he or she is not qualified to administer and interpret psychological testing. Nonetheless, on both in Canada and in the U.S., we have legions of psychiatrists who are doing psychological testing for which they are entirely unqualified. Also, we want to know 
In this child custody evaluation, if psychological testing was involved, was the testing done under appropriate standardized conditions? Let me give you an example. A father in Michigan goes in uh, to start out participating in a child custody evaluation, and it starts out with him taking a psychological test. He shows up at the psychologist's office. The psychologist is not there. The only person in the office is the psychologist's secretary. The secretary gives the dad <coughs> instructions as to how to complete the test. But his dad is going through the test. He's sitting out in the waiting room of the office where people are walking in and out. You know, the mailman comes in and out. UPS guy is in and out. The secretary is on the phone. And at various times, dad has clarifying questions that he needs to ask. And the secretary, in response to dad's question, says, well, I'm not really sure. Uh, just, just do the best you can and discuss it with Dr. Smith. No, under those circumstances, that test has not been administered in an appropriately standardized manner. And the results have been skewed because what became evident was dad's response to this psychological test was influenced by his increasing frustration created by the circumstances in which he was taking the test. Now, the greatest problem with child custody evaluations is what Robert Emery, a Virginia psychologist, uh, has said in, in, in print, uh, saying, quote, we are dubious about child custody evaluations because of the absence of psychological science, unquote. Absence of psychological science related to the evaluations. There is no standardized, validated psychological test that directly assesses parental competence or parental effectiveness. Such a test does not exist. As a result, without any test directly assessing parental effectiveness, child custody evaluations amount to one inference imposed on another inference imposed on still another inference. And the chain of inferences can begin to very, very easily break down. Now, when I say there are no psychological tests designed and validated for assessing parental effectiveness, some people might say, well, how about the Brooklyn perceptual scales? Uh, if, if any psychologist wants to rely on the Brooklyn scales to draw inferences about parental effectiveness, that psychologist should be uh, thoroughly cross-examined and exposed for how ill-informed he or she is because the Brooklyn purports to, uh, among other things, identify a child's unconscious preference for one parent over another. Unconscious preference? Uh, we've got enough problems when it comes to divorce and parenting. Do we really want to introduce Freudian theory into the whole equation? I, I don't think so. Uh, there is another uh, procedure called the ASPECT. ASPECT is an acronym for the ackerman schorendorf Scales for Parent Evaluation of Custody. Of custody. The ASPECT is simply a procedure for combining scores from different tests. Again, 
there are no validity data supporting either the Aspect or Brooklyn procedures, but yet there are large numbers of psychologists who will march into court and express their expert opinions premised upon the Brooklyn and or Aspect procedures. Now, various psychological tests, such as the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory Dash 2 Second Edition, which I'll refer to as the MMPI 2, the uh, Millen Clinical, the Millen Clinical Multiaxial Inventory uh, Dash 3, which I'll call the MCMI 3, the Personality Assessment Inventory, and the Rorschach, the Inkblot Test can all be computer scored and computer interpreted. Now, these circumstances can make for evidentiary problems that are a veritable nightmare. You can have a situation where, in the course of a child custody evaluation, we have a computer interpreting the profiles of the two parents involved. Now, the data and the decision-making rules that are used are proprietary information. The publisher of these programs are not going to tell me what their decision-making rules are. They want to keep that information confidential so they can sell their service repeatedly. Consequently, what we have is a situation where psychologists use these programs, but they don't know how the programs are constructed and how the programs go about reaching their decisions. To make the situation all the more difficult, it's a very, very common practice for psychologists, oh, and especially psychiatrists, to plagiarize statements from computerized narratives and never identify that the statement came from a computerized narrative. In other words, you read the report and you won't know that the psychologist relied on a computerized interpretation to express and support his or her opinions. Um, if you've done enough of them, like I have, you can recognize the language, and you know this has been plagiarized, and plagiarizing material is unethical. Also, too often child custody evaluators will cherry pick statements from computerized reports. That is, if they go into an evaluation with pre-existing expectations, they will cherry pick all statements that are consistent with their expectations and overlook all statements that are inconsistent with their a priori expectations. Now, what I'm getting at is when we consider these issues so far, related to child custody evaluations. Unqualified people doing psychological testing in non-standardized conditions, uh, making inference after inference unsupported by relevant data, relying on uh, ill-developed computerized interpretation. Can those scenarios contribute to parental alienation? Absolutely yes, because you have ill-informed, biased people responding to their own agenda while disregarding relevant scientific data. Now, also in terms of computerized interpretations of psychological tests, different test publishers 
provide different computerized programs. Now, some of you may have in the past associated uh, the MMPI with the University of Minnesota Press. And, and, that, and that used to be the relationship where the University of Minnesota Press published the MMPI. More recently, however, Pearson assessments have bought out the interest of the University of Minnesota Press. So we have Pearson assessments, psychological assessment uh, resources located in Florida, Western Psychological Services located in California, uh, and other publishers all offering computerized interpretations of different psychological tests. And if you take the same test data and you have it interpreted by different computerized programs, often you will get very different statements about the same test responses from the same person, obviously raising the question, which computerized program is accurate? And no one knows. That's the kind of study that needs to be done, has never been done. Also, when cross-examining psychologists who rely on computerized test interpretations, you could ask them questions such as, for all of the tests that we've talked about, the tests have multiple scales. So you could ask a psychologist, now, does the elevation of a clinical scale reach clinical significance on the basis of that one scale and that one scale alone? Or do we have to have two or more scales elevated for clinical significance? An altogether legitimate, important question. No psychologist using a computerized interpretation can answer that question because the information necessary to answer it is not available to us. Also, with the exception of the Rorschach test, the inkblot test, all of the other tests have what we call validity scales. These are scales that identify whether or not individuals are attempting to over-report or exaggerate and embellish symptoms. You very rarely see that in a custody evaluation. Or are people putting forth an effort to under-report any problems or any symptoms, which does happen very commonly in custody evaluations. It happens so commonly, it's normal for that setting. So we need to know, for this interpretive program, uh, does it consider validity scales related to over-reporting and under-reporting? Don't know, because test publishers aren't telling us. In fact, it is very, very common in child custody evaluations for MMPI2 profiles initially to come back uh, in a manner that they cannot be directly interpreted because the parent responding was overly defensive and underreported any, any problems or, or, or any conflicts. Now, too often, Evaluators who are unfamiliar with the relevant research will merely say, Mr. Jones's L score, lie score, on the MMPI2 was elevated and his profile cannot be interpreted as a result. What kind of impression does that leave with a judge? Okay, and it's an ill-informed impression. 
Because if you know the relevant research, you know there's a straightforward procedure for correcting this kind of a problem. That is, merely call the individual back in, you explain to them, in these kinds of circumstances, there are people who will put forth a persistent effort trying to make themselves look a little bit more positive, a little bit better than they really are. And I'd like you to take the inventory again, putting forth an effort to be as candid and self-disclosing as you are, understanding you're just a human being, no more, no less. Using that procedure for retesting, you can obtain valid MMPI2 profiles in approximately 80% of cases that are retested. However, the vast majority of psychologists are totally unfamiliar with the relevant scientific data supporting that procedure. Therefore, if someone invalidates an MMPI or some other test the first time through, they're left hanging. The MMPI-2 is the single most frequently administered test in child custody evaluations. And we have enormous problems with it. It is becoming more and more evident that the MMPI-2 essentially identifies and assesses the extent to which individuals are burdened with feelings of demoralization. Demoralization can best be defined as feeling overwhelmed, hopeless, pessimistic, and exceedingly bleak about one's future. Now, let's ask ourselves a semi-obvious question. Are people in the midst of a divorce proceeding often contending with feelings of demoralization? My God, yes. I want to see who's in the midst of a divorce proceeding and is not contending with demoralization. Therefore, what the data are telling us now is the MMPI is identifying a situationally specific phenomenon highly related to divorce that is time limited. Because it's time limited, we want to use this data to draw inferences about parental effectiveness? No, I don't think that's going to work. In many child custody evaluations, we'll also have evaluators resorting to intelligence testing. I mean, he has an IQ of 117. She has an IQ of 112, therefore he gets custody. No, I don't think so. Robert Sternberg, past president of the American Psychological Association and on the faculty at Yale University has said, quote, even the most charitable estimates of the relation between intelligence test scores and real world criteria, which you're really doing in the real world, such as job performance, indicate that approximately three quarters of the variance in real world performance is independent of formal intelligence. Therefore, why are we wasting people's time and energy doing intelligence testing if it's clear and evident that uh, both parents fall at least within the average range of intelligence? Also need to make some specific comments about the Millen, Millen Clinical Multiaxial Inventory 3. The MCMI3 assumes maladjustment or psychopathology. 
the MCMI3 was validated on a large sample of individuals in outpatient counseling or psychotherapy. Consequently, it assumes that if you're taking this inventory, you are somehow screwed up and we're just merely going to proceed to identify in what way are you screwed up? Which, of course, again, if we think in terms of demoralization and the processes of divorce, divorce is a very distressing, situationally related phenomenon that for most people does come to an effective resolution. About five or six years ago, the journal Law and Human Behavior published a fascinating analysis of 82 child custody evaluations done in the state of Illinois. And the number one finding, according to uh, the study authors, was, quote, evaluators often seem to neglect a direct assessment of parenting skills, unquote. Psychologists love to do very generalized omnibus personality assessments and then relying on their own preferred version of personality theory, those psychologists will uh, make all kinds of inferences about an individual's parental effectiveness. But sometimes even the inferences get lost because the psychologist becomes preoccupied with the supposed characteristics of this individual's personality. Now, moreover, child custody evaluations will often use the parent-child relationship inventory. This is a good news, bad news situation. Parent-child relationship inventory can tell you a good deal about the dynamics of the relationship between mothers and their adolescent children. The parent-child relationship inventory will tell you virtually nothing about the dynamics between fathers and their adolescent children. Why the breakdown? We don't know. But we do know, don't rely on the parent-child relationship inventory for drawing any conclusions about the dynamics of relationships between fathers and their adolescent children or pre-adolescent children. And then finally, let's talk briefly about projective tests. The Rorschach inkblot test, the draw a person test where you're simply asked, draw me a picture of a person. Uh, the thematic app perception test where you look at pictures, antiquated pictures, and you're asked to make up a story about the pictures that you see. Let me tell you an anecdote about the first time I took the Rorschach. I was 20 years of age and a good friend of mine was a first year graduate student at Wynn University in Detroit. And he was taking a Rorschach class. And one of the assignments was in the Rorschach class, you had to recruit guinea pigs, people who were going to take the Rorschach from other students. And moreover, the instructor did have the good sense that you could not give the Rorschach to your own guinea pig. I mean, because this is someone who you knew and that would be kind of a violation of confidence. So you had to trade guinea pigs. So my good buddy recruited me and I got traded. And the graduate student, young woman, who administered the Rorschach to me was nothing but knockout beautiful. I mean, there's beautiful and there's Oh my God, I think I'm having an asthma attack, beautiful. 
She was the latter. So as I'm going through the Rorschach, there was, there's one card that people will often say it looks like a bear rug. You know, and I saw the bear rug and I said, yeah, there's this kind of thing where I want to take my shirt off, lay down on the rug and roll around. <laughs> And at that time, and in response to that examiner, oh yes, I did. And what, what the anecdote illustrates is projective techniques cannot be standardized because of examiner influence. At 20 years of age, I have no doubt that if I had taken the Rorschach from a male examiner, as opposed to the exceedingly attractive female, my responses would have been quite different. Consequently, because examiners will vary in terms of their gender and personality characteristics, projective techniques in general, and the Rorschach in particular, cannot be standardized. You never know. Are these responses a function of the person who took the test? Or are these responses influenced more by the examiner who administered the test? So we're going to use this instrument to identify parental effectiveness and make recommendations about custody and parenting time in divorce cases? That's insane. It should never be done, but it is done again and again and again. Also, what's interesting with the Rorschach Vinkblatt test is there's a strong relationship between uh, the number of responses you give in your level of education. Uh, more years of education, the more responses people will give to the Rorschach because there's no limit on the number of responses. I mean, if you want to see someone go crazy, get someone who has a college degree in fine arts <laughs> responding to the Rorschach. I mean, it's fascinating. They'll, uh, they'll show you stuff that me as an examiner, I've never seen before. But what happens is, as the number of responses to a Rorschach increase, it becomes easier to find evidence of pathology. And so we don't know, are we really seeing evidence of maladjustment or pathology? or are we merely inferring maladjustment and pathology because we have a greater number of responses allowing us to make those inferences. And again, the bottom line is do not use the Rorschach in child custody evaluations. Sometimes Rorschachers can just get absolutely carried away with utter nonsense. For example, they'll say a reflection response. Now, the subject says, it looks like trees reflected in the water growing on the bank of a river. Well, reflection responses are supposed to be indicative of narcissistic personalities. Now, are there any data to support that interpretation? No, but these are theoretically driven interpretations that Rorschachers find very appealing. Food responses. For example, a uh, drumstick from a holiday turkey. I, I see a drumstick from a holiday turkey on the card. That's supposed to be indicative of a <coughs> supposed to be indicative of a dependent personality who seeks structure and guidance from other people. Again, are there any data available to support this entirely speculative interpretation? Nope, none at all. Also, however, <laughs> 
we have computerized scoring and computerized interpretation services available for the Rorschach. Now again, what is the, what is the database and what are the reliabilities and validities of that database supporting the interpretations of the Rorschach? Nobody knows. Data haven't been published. So we can have psychologists resorting to entirely subjective impressions and interpretations of the Rorschach gained from computerized interpretations, putting those computerized interpretations in their report without identifying that the source of the statements are computerized interpretations. And you can cherry pick again uh, what interpretations you include in your report. Under those circumstances, can an ill-informed psychologist uh, contribute to the increasing polarization of a nasty, difficult divorce? Absolutely, yes. And then, in terms of the Rorschach, never, never, never use the Rorschach with children. Consider the following study. This is a study where uh, we looked at the Rorschach responses of children between the ages of 7 and 12 in order for the children to participate <coughs> in this study. They had to <coughs> they had to satisfy five different conditions. One, the children could not have any history of any mental health treatment. Two, uh, children could not have any history of any kind of juvenile offending. Three, the children could not have had more than one suspension from school. Four, the children could have no history of alcohol abuse or abuse of any other controlled substance. And five, the children's scholastic grades had to be a grade average of C or higher. So when you use those five criteria uh, as, as ruling out criteria, what you end up with is a sample of altogether normal, exceedingly well-adjusted kids. And you get this sample of normal, well-adjusted kids, and uh, the study's authors administered the Rorschach to them. The kids were fascinated by the Rorschach, saying, oh, hey, this is interesting. Look at this. And, oh, I just saw this. And the kids found the experience to be uh, new and kind of provocative. However, when the Rorschach responses of these children were scored and, and interpreted by a computer. The study's authors pointed out that the kids would be characterized as, quote, grossly misperceiving and misinterpreting their surroundings, exhibiting unconventional ideation and significant cognitive impairment. In other words, the Rorschach said these kids were colossally maladjusted, but in fact, we know this is a sample of normal, well-adjusted kids who are doing just fine. Therefore, will the Rorschach overpathologize children? Yes, time and time again. Just imagine what a child custody evaluator can do with a child's Rorschach uh, in circumstances of a parenting time dispute, leaping to the conclusion, this is an exceedingly distressed, horribly upset child, and the parents are driving this kid crazy. No, the Rorschach is making the kid look crazy when in fact that may not be the case. When all is said and done, one of the best comments I ever heard about projective techniques came uh, from a psychologist in Montreal uh, by the name of Frank Dumont. And 
his position is when it comes to projective techniques, the Rorschach, draw a person, draw a house, the thematic apperception test, and so forth. His position is <clears throat> psychologists find in projective techniques whatever they are predisposed to find. In other words, if they think they're going to find it, they find it. Now, let's turn our attention to allegations of domestic violence. And again, can allegations of domestic violence become a weapon in alienation cases? Oh yeah, absolutely. Now, when we're talking about domestic violence, it becomes necessary to distinguish between what we call on the one hand, common couple violence versus patriarchal terrorism. Common couple violence refers to um, mutual shoving and pushing that will go on in some marriages. When it comes to common couple violence, where each spouse takes turns, sometimes pushing and shoving the other one, by a slight margin, females engage in more pushing and shoving than males do. Of course, the difference is <clears throat> males are physically stronger and the consequences of their pushing and shoving can be more serious than uh, the lightweight wife. But so often what will happen is common couple violence gets escalated by anecdote and allegation into patriarchal terrorism. Patriarchal terrorism being an outcome where <clears throat> the husband uses violence as a means for controlling the wife. Now, the many, many problems of parental alienation and the unfortunate contributions that mental health professionals make to those problems will not be resolved by asking ourselves questions such as, is parental alienation really a syndrome? That question is nothing but a huge distraction. Questions about alienation as a syndrome amount to rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. That is, you can have a situation where children are overwhelmed by the bitter accusations of their parents feeling increasingly estranged and isolated from one parent or the other or both parents. In those circumstances of stress and turmoil, does it make any sense to distract ourselves by asking, is alienation really a syndrome? No, it does not. For example, we can talk about a coronary episode, a coronary infarction, or acute coronary stress, but in all circumstances, the individual has had or is on the verge of having a heart attack. Now, do you confine yourself to definitional, definitional issues or do you respond to the life-threatening circumstances of that individual in cardiac distress? Obviously, you do the latter. So people who want to raise the issue of is, is parental alienation a formal syndrome are asking the wrong question at the wrong time in the wrong place 
while neglecting the welfare of children who are too often suffering enormously. And it's incumbent upon organizations such as this one to respond to these kinds of problems because, again, the mental health professional organizations are not going to do it. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Campbell for being here today. That was a wonderful presentation. Please join me in giving another round of applause for Dr. Terrence Campbell. Thank you for traveling all the way from Michigan to be here today. We appreciate that. Good morning. I'd like to introduce a man who has dedicated himself to helping so many people in our community here in Toronto. Uh, this uh, gentleman is a director of FACT. Uh, please. Welcome Brian Jenkins to the podium. Thank you.